afternoon and welcome to Driver's Ed, uh, the remote edition. Uh, this is my studio. This is where we're going to probably have the remainder of our classes. Uh, I hope that you're able to tune in when we're going live, but I understand people have jobs and they can't make it. Uh, I've already heard from a few people. So hopefully everybody has received my text and received the homework that you will be doing after today's session. And I also gave an additional assignment, which we'll be doing during our next session. So uh, download that. Um, I want you to be able to provide comments. And that's basically what we're going to do here uh, because I can't see you. Uh, I don't have a feed where I see who's tuning in who's not so basically your comments are going to be not only your attendance but also how I grade participation and what you do for the handed in homework so let's just kind of get the uh, house cleaning out of the way like I do with most classes and we talk about a few things before we get going so we are in the midst of a very bad crisis and you know that more than I because you have other classes that you have to do uh, the school is closed down. I believe that the tentative schedule is the first week of April, which would put driver's ed uh, basically right up against our last week. Uh, if that is the case, we will do online remote to that time, and then the last week we'll come back to meet as a group. We'll finish up the few sections that we have remaining, and then we will uh, do the last couple classes like uh, we do. Um, I'm going to try to check to see. I see there's four people that are looking right now, so I I can't. I'm going to actually go to YouTube right now and uh, see. Oh, that's interesting. So I I can see where I, where I'm at. So I'm going to close out of that and get back into where you are. Now we've got five. So it seems like we've got more people coming on. Uh, if you are in contact with uh, some of your driver's ed classmates, remind them. If people could leave a comment right now in YouTube, uh, because sometimes maybe your handle is difficult to understand who you are. So if you could just put your name at this time and, and let me know how the, the video looks, how the sound is. That is going to help me provide you the best learning environment. Because nothing is worse than seeing something that is blurry or the sound is bad. Uh, you're going you're gonna to fall asleep more than you do in my actual class. So please give me uh, helpful uh, criticism so I can make this a very good program for you. Um, the state has started to provide some guidelines for driver's ed. It's still kind of up in the air. I believe that most classes will be going somewhat remote uh, sometime soon. So I'm kind of ahead of the curve right now uh, with this class. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to talk to probably other instructors and see what they're using. But this is a program that I've downloaded for my Mac uh, that I seem somewhat comfortable with. I will be honest, the last couple days have been trying, trying to get videos to actually work, uh, to get the sound quality, uh, to get uh, what we have for a background and actually I'm working on a green screen right now let's see if I can just change you I want to I want to change this for a minute to show you what I tried to do for you guys so just to make you feel a little bit more at home you ready let's get back to our regular classroom hey look it we're back in Q's room 223 so um, I was going to use that for a, a background but I really kind of like the brick makes it a little bit more I think homey. So we're going to kind of go with that to start off with. Um, get your textbook if you don't have it. Uh, chapter 7 is what we're going to take a look at. We're going to talk about eyes, vision, uh, how we can uh, really do the most that we possibly can to get the best uh, environment to make sound decisions with driving because you can't make a good decision. You can't make good judgments in driving if you can't see what is happening up ahead. That's where the breakdown is for a lot of mistakes, is that people zone out, they're not paying attention, they're distracted, 
uh, we can have things that are hidden by buildings and trees and bushes and moving cars. So anything that we can do to help us see the road better will help us to make better decisions and to be a better driver. Um, so get a uh, paper to write on, to take notes, and a pen to write down. Now everything that I show you, uh, you don't have to write down. Um, like I do in my normal class, not everything is important that you're going to see on the screen, just like everything that you read in the textbook isn't something that you're going to have to memorize for a test. And we are going to try to do the midterm. This was the week we were supposed to have it. We're going to push that back, of course, because classes haven't uh, happened. So we're looking at probably the middle of next week to do our midterm. And um, if you have any questions about how that's going to be, it's going to be just like the pretest that you did when you first came into driver's ed. Oh, I just lost my light. Well, I'll have to remember that. The battery on my light isn't uh, the best, so I'll do a different light um, later. Um, so let's get right to it. Let's take a look at Chapter 7. So I'm going to drop this into the screen, and I'm going to talk over it. So here we go. Let's take a look. There we go. Uh, Madison, I see Madison just joined us. There's 14 comments, so I like that. Very good. Uh, so what's going to happen here, let's see if I can just push things out of the way so you can see. And I'm going to kind of just go uh, slide by side so you can see things. So let's see if I can actually get myself picture in picture here. Let's see if I can. I don't know if that's going to work. I'm going to have to find out how I can get. I thought there was a way that I could get my self into this. Oh, all right. So uh, we're going to take a look at five aspects of good vision. So visual acuity, distance vision, depth perception, central vision, and peripheral vision. So let's take a look at uh, visual acuity. And I do want you to write this down. And just write down the first sentence up here. It says, whether or not objects or hazards in your driving path are sharp and clear. Any time that you have blurred vision, there is going to be a delay in your mind about what you've actually seen. Your mind has to come to grips what it thinks it sees and then make a concrete decision whether it's something that you have to pay attention to as a driver. So down below it gives you an example. It says traveling at 30 miles per hour with the 2020 vision. You can read a six inch street sign from a distance of about 180 to 225 feet or four or five seconds away. With 2040 vision, you would have to be within 90 to 135 feet or two, three, two or three seconds away to read the same sign. So what you've got to take away from this is that I want more time to make better decisions. Doesn't that make sense? Of course it does. Uh, so anytime that you see things the last second, it's going to create a last second reaction. You better hope it's right, because if it's not, you're going to drive yourself into a bad situation. If you have more time, even if you make a bad decision, you're going to have time to correct it. And that's what we want to do. More time gives us a little less stress, and we're able to make better decisions. Uh, the next term um, that we have here is distance vision. If your distance vision is poor, you may not see hazards till it's too late to react safely. Uh, what could come into play here would be if you wear glasses like I do, um, they can get a little bit smudged. Um, they could get fogged up depending on the weather. Uh, same thing with your windshield. And in your notes, write this down. Distance vision will be affected if you are not using your defroster when the windshield is starting to fog up. Even in the summertime, if you come into a car and you've been working out, your body temperature is so high that you're going to put moisture into the air and the inside windows, you know, if you play sports, you know this happens. It is going to fog up. Crack the window, crank the air conditioning, set it on defrost, it will clear up. Um, so poor distance vision, excessive speed increases risk of making unreliable judgments and potentially disastrous results. 
The next one I want you to write down, and this has a lot to do with, with parking, is depth perception. This is knowing where you are seated in the car and where you, the front of your vehicle is and where the back of your vehicle is. So what are some other examples? Judging objects correctly, passing other cars. When you look in your side mirror, and part of the reason why I want you to start off using your side mirror with a little bit of the side of the car in the side mirror is to give you that ability to have depth perception. Where is my car in relationship to what's coming up to the side of me? Uh, following cars, very important to know. You're four seconds behind the car in front of you. Look in your rearview mirror. Do you have four seconds behind you? One of the last classes that we had, we talked about a space cushion around your vehicle. Uh, do you have anybody con kind of creeping into that area? Because if they are, you're going to have to basically change your position. And we talked about the different lane positions. Uh, pulling out into traffic is important. You've got your directional on, checking your mirrors, looking over your shoulder before you pull out, like from a parallel parking spot. Um, and, of course, judging stopping distances. And this is a big one. And we're going to talk more about that in another slide. Okay, central vision. Okay, what you focus on is what you see uh, most clearly. So this is where we're going to get everybody involved. So that it looks like there are 12 people looking uh, right now to this presentation. So what I want you to do is to make a comment what you see in this picture. Now I'm only going to put it on um, the desktop here for about three or four seconds, and then I'm going to take it off. So let me go back. Oh, let me go forward. Let me show you the picture first. Here we go. One, two, three. Okay, what do you see? Write it down. In the comments, write down what you see. Give me at least three or four different things, okay? What you mainly see in this picture. Let me go out of it, okay? I'm going to try to figure out this picture in picture. Okay, let's go back and take a look at the picture. I'm going to see if I can get comments up here. See, write it down. In the comments, write down what you see. Give me at least So I see Joey, things. Olivia, okay. Luca, Amazing Natalie, Madison. Picture. Let me go out of it. Val, I'm Lizzie. Figure out this picture and picture. Okay, big tree, a lake. Okay, a body of water, two people. Natalie says a person. Okay, Jesse sees two. Uh, Josie sees two people, tree, water, tree, lake, people. Okay, Let's like the comments. Good, 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 good. Okay, we'll on. stop right here for a second. Let me get out of my YouTube. So let me go down here. So Joey, Olivia, Luca, Natalie, Madison. Val, Lizzie. Okay, take a look at the picture again. Let me get out of this. Okay, body of... Okay. You've got to look beyond what you actually see. Now, most of you did the right thing, and you did the obvious. You see the two people, the couple. You see the tree. You see a body of water. It could be an island in the back. But if I told you, the reason I showed you this picture is because this picture was drawn because it is a baby. This is a picture of a baby. If you take a look, let's see if I can get my cursor up here. Okay, I don't know if you can see right in the middle Okay, where the tree branch is. You can see the feet where it starts to bend. You can see the back of the baby on the shoreline. You can see the eye and the mouth or whatever. That is what the picture is. Now, what I'm trying to say here is a lot of times we're driving and we think we see a parked car. We think we see a pedestrian. But there's something else that you're just missing. You're missing the bigger picture, something that is more vital to driving. And what we call that, and I want you to write down this term, it's called inattention blindness. Inattention blindness is the failure by a person to notice something, you don't have to write stimulus, that is in plain sight. This stimulus is usually unexpected, but it's fully visible. This usually happens to humans that have an overload of input coming into their mind. It's impossible to pay attention to every single input that is presented. A person's attention cannot be focused on everything. Therefore, everyone experiences inattention blindness.
Now, I'm going to try to show you a video. So this is going to be a first for me. So let's see if I can get the screen up here. Oh, there I am. I'm back on. I'm back on. Okay. I want to show you. Let's do this one. This one. The difference between these two men seems obvious. Their faces are different, their hair is different, even their shirts are a different color. And yet an experiment by psychologists Dan Simons and Chris Chabri at Harvard reveals that our brains actually process very little of what comes in through the eyes. In this experiment, a subject comes up to a counter and a first experiment the difference between these two men seems obvious. Their faces are different, their hair is different, even their shirts are a different color. And yet an experiment by psychologists Dan Simons and Chris Chabri at Harvard reveals that our brains actually process very little of what comes in through the eyes. In this experiment, a subject comes up to a counter and a first experimenter hands them a consent form. As soon as they finish signing the consent form, they hand it back to the first experimenter, who then takes the consent form, ducks down behind the counter to put it away, and a different experimenter then stands up and hands the subject a packet of information and sends them into a hallway where we ask them questions about it. This wonderful experiment uncovers an aspect of the brain's attention system known as change blindness. Change blindness is the idea that we often miss large changes to our visual world from one view to the next. We're often not able to see large changes that would appear to be perfectly obvious to somebody who knows they're going to happen. And incredibly, in 75% of cases, the subjects don't notice a thing. The lady who took me up here, she opened the door for me and told me to walk over to the desk. I think there was a sign that said experiment. Mm -hmm. And a man there gave me a form to sign. Mm -hmm. There was the guy standing under a big sign that said experiment. Mm -hmm. um, and to my left, there was like a pot with some mm -hmm. dirt in it and some plastic containers. Oh, I filled out a form. Okay. Right. How long would it be about before it's in about 10, 15 minutes or so. I guess I have the time to do that. Did you notice anything unusual at all uh, after you signed the consent form? I just signed it and I didn't even pay attention to anything that was written on it. Okay. Yeah. Um, after, after you handed it back to him, um, mm -hmm. did you notice anything unusual happen at all? If you could just take this into the next no. room. No, I, uh, I probably wasn't even looking that direction. I probably okay. turned and looked towards the clear door. I saw some people there. Okay. Then I turned back and looked at him for a second. Okay. Did you notice anything unusual at all after you signed the consent form? No. This is only going to take five or ten minutes. Yeah. Okay. It'll take. It'll be real short. Okay. The person who stood up was actually a different person. <laughs> okay. Um, I gather you didn't notice no. that that was different. No. A different person actually stood up and handed you this form, um, and sent you out toward me. Um, I gather from. Your reaction, you didn't notice that? No. Okay. Um, don't, don't feel bad about that. Actually, uh, most of the time, we find about 75% of people don't notice. Are you uh, serious? Yeah. The person who stood up with the packet was actually a different person. Wow. Than, uh, than the first person. That is yeah. incredible. So I gather, I gather you didn't see it. Then. I didn't catch that, no. Okay. What's really interesting is that some people notice these changes and other people don't notice these changes. If you could just take this. And we really don't yet have a good idea what separates those people who don't from those people who do. It might be that there are individual differences and some people are better able to detect these sorts of changes. But it's also possible that it's just coincidence that the people who noticed it just happened to be focusing on a feature that changed. They just happened to be paying attention to the color of the person's shirt. <laughs> And the people who failed to notice it just happened to be paying attention to something. Isn't that crazy? Uh, something is 
obvious to most of us would be a person ducks down behind the desk and then someone else comes up. We see that. We know that. But our mind gets distracted by things. And that's the thing you got to remember as a driver that it's more uh, driving that you do. You'll start to sense that you're thinking of other things, that I'm going home. What am I going to have to eat? I'm going to school. Do I have all my homework? And driving gets to be pretty rote. It gets to be that muscle memory that we were talking about. And we're missing vital information. Now, let's play a little bit of a game. Let's see if I can get this to play. Let me see if I can drop this into the screen. Let's actually just... I think I have the sound taken care of. So let's take a look at this. Okay, what you got to do in this video is pay attention to the magician. Okay, tell me in the comments what has changed. Okay, so let's watch this. Watch this next sequence carefully. At the end, I'll ask you a question about what you've seen. Hi, I'm Magic Singh, and today we're in Portobello Road, and I'm going to show you guys a classic in magic using matches. And today to help me out is Mark. Mark, I'll tell you what, place your hand up for me nice and flat. Now, I promise this won't hurt, all right? So here's the idea. Let's just light this up, and if you close onto that nice and tight, here we go. Watch this. Keep watching. I don't know if you felt that or not. Tell you what, have a look inside. Open it up. See how the match is actually returned into the book and it's still burnt. Okay, you're not impressed. All right, it was my first trick ever. But here's the idea. Just place that back in your hand, close it tight and turn it face down again if you can. Now we're gonna use one more thing and we're gonna use a magician's best friend, playing cards. Now the idea is really simple. You're gonna choose one. So take any one you like. Perfect. Have a look for yourself and do me a favor, show the camera as well if you can. Brilliant. And you know what? Place it back face up on the deck. Now, it doesn't matter if I see what the card is, because we're going to do something completely different. Just watch this. Here we go. I'll do it slowly. Watch the king. You know why? I don't know if you felt that or not. Tell you what, have a look inside. Open it up. Oh. Check it out. It's the, uh, it's king Isn't that cool? Lines. It's my card. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Did you watch the trick closely? This is a famous illusion called inattention blindness. This illusion is not about the magic. While watching the routine, you may or may not have noticed the changes taking place. The question is, how many changes did you see? Was there one, were there three, or were there five? Okay, I'm gonna freeze it right here. I'm gonna move this over so um, I can see, and you can see me. So you just watched this video, and they're giving you Three choices. Did one thing change, three things change, or five? So someplace in the comment on YouTube here, write down how many changes you saw. And for extra credit, write down what they were. So just don't take a guess. You've got to know what actually changed. I'm going to give you just a few minutes to think about it. About a minute, actually. Someone said five. His appearance changed. Five, five, five. Everybody's saying five. That's pretty cool. All right, let's take a look at the rest of the video and let's take a look what actually changed. Remember the, the video that we just got done finishing? Let's see. It's actually three. The answer is there were three changes. The first change was the red hanky to a green one. The second was his shirt swapping to a t-shirt. A lot of people got that. The last was his assistant becoming a completely different now, person. Now, how could you miss? How many if did no you No one see? saw this happen. So why is this it is showing you these big changes? And the reason is that the brain receives so much information on its eyes that you can't see everything simultaneously. 
So instead, it picks and chooses according to what it thinks is important. If you change something that it doesn't think is important, you just literally don't see it. All right, I got one last video here with um, inattention blindness because, like I said, it's so hard to get things lined up. And I'm sure when I go back and review what you just watched, you know, the sound or how big it is, you know, let me know what could be a little bit better. But I want to show you one more. Let's see if this works. You are about to take part in a quick experiment. Take a look at this. Okay, now, did you happen to notice anything odd? Watch again. Do you see anything different in this video? See any changes? Don't worry if you didn't see that it's two different men. It means your brain is doing exactly what it should be. It's focusing on the meaning of the scene rather than on the irrelevant details. Imagine how much energy and brain mass it would take for us to remember every single person, place, or thing we encountered. The things that matter, a conversation with a coworker, or your child's first step, would be drowned by a deluge of information. So when there are minor changes to the world around us, we often don't pick up on them. There are two similar phenomena at work. Inattentional blindness is the failure to notice something that's fully obvious right there in front of you when you're attention is engaged on something or someone else. Change blindness is a failure to notice a difference between what's there right now and what was there a moment ago. Scientists such as Daniel Simons from the University of Illinois have spent years devising experiments testing just how perceptive and unperceptive humans actually are. So we feel like we're aware of everything, that we're taking in all of the details, and that if something unimportant happens, we'll automatically notice it. It'll capture our attention. The reality is that we often don't notice unexpected things because we're aware of far less of our world than we think we are. So how much or how little are we actually aware of? We decided to recreate one of Simon's most famous experiments to see for ourselves. Here's the setup. Our senior series producer, Vin, poses as a lost pedestrian and asks a passerby for directions. Excuse me, I'm looking for the skyline. Then we break the two up, walking through them holding a large sheet of wood. Now watch as I replace Vin. You might think people would notice the switch, but almost half the time, they didn't. Of course, that means more than half the time they did. We only tried the experiment nine times, and by no means was it good science. But we were surprised four people didn't notice the switch. In Simon's original experiment, seven out of 15 people didn't either. So what determines whether or not you can figure out the switch? When you look at another person, you encode what's relevant for what you're doing right then, in that case, giving directions, and you don't pay attention to the details that are irrelevant, say what color their shirt is or exactly how tall they are. As long as you are able to make sense of the meaning of the scene and roughly the main categories of that person, um, say their height, their age, what race they are, what sex they are, as long as those important things don't change, the meaning of the scene really hasn't changed and you're not going to notice that anything's different. Scientists have documented inattentional and change blindness since the 1970s, and while they allow you to focus your attention, this failure to see every detail can prove costly. Drivers often cause accidents because they overlook quick changes to their environments, such as pedestrians or cyclists. Faulty memories can wreak havoc during eyewitness testimony. The goal of vision isn't to build a photograph or a complete model of the world in your mind, the goal of vision is to make sense of the meaning of the world around you. Being aware of our limitations can help us adapt and compensate for them, allowing us to do things that prevent the really negative consequences that can happen due to failures of awareness. For example, Simons thinks that people might be willing to put away their cell phone when driving if they just understood the limits to their attention. Juries might realize that eyewitness testimony is far from ideal. And the next time you and a friend are fighting about the details of a past event, it's likely you're both wrong. Now that's something to remember. Okay, he, he brought up a lot of good points. Um, let's see if I can um, get back to the screen with the, the PowerPoint. Well, let me leave it on this for just a second. So you wrote down the definition in attention blindness. I also want you to put down 
change blindness. Now, change blindness, more or less, as he said at the very end of that video, has a lot to do with distracted driving. Because when you take your eyes away from the road, right now my, my phone is down in front of me. So if I look down and I look back up, in those two or three seconds that I look down, something could have happened. A bicyclist, pedestrian, a light change, uh, a pothole that I didn't in initially see. So change blindness is a little bit different. Inattention blindness is you're staring at the road and something's not clicking. It's right in front of you, but for whatever reason, the input isn't telling your brain, deal with that stop sign, deal with that pedestrian, deal with the brake lights of the car in front of me. Uh, so they're, they're closely related, uh, but change blindness has more to do with distractions by taking your focus away. So make sure you put that down in your notes. Let's see if I can get this back into the screen. Here we go. Of course, it takes me right back to the uh, at the beginning, but now I'm at the bottom. So let me kind of zip through this real quick to get us back to where we need to be. These are some of the videos that I had. Um, so I want you to write down a few questions, and I want you to either text them to me like you've been doing with your homework, um, or you can email me, and I'll put the email Probably on the next presentation, I'm going to have something down in the bottom corner. But uh, tolldrivingschool at gmail.com. If you don't feel comfortable or it's too lengthy to do a homework assignment, you can always just email me. And by the way, we haven't had a chance to take a look at videos. I know people did videos for the CPL project. Uh, we'll take a look at that if we have class. If not, uh, YouTube it to me. You know, let me have a link and I'll try to link it into what we see so we can have some fun and take a look at what you guys worked on with your uh, seatbelt, helmet, or airbag project. And um, I really would like to see that. So send that along to me if you can. So let's take a look at these questions. What could we be missing in the driving scene? I think I kind of answered that question in the last minute or two, so you don't really have to answer that one. But I do want you to answer these last two. Okay, where could we most be affected by inattention blindness in driving? Doesn't have to be more than a sentence. You know, text it to me. Uh, put it in the comment. If right now you're on your computer and you don't want to get out of it and don't get on your phone, just put it in the comments below. Same thing, what time of day um, would inattention blindness most likely occur? Uh, if you take a look out the window, you may have an idea, um, a good answer to write down. And also it's on the opposite time of the clock. Um... Okay, I want you to write down peripheral vision. We kind of did this in class. Um, it's 180 degrees on either side, what you're looking at. Uh, we know that we can split our car up into uh, six sections. We've got the center of our vision out the front windshield. We've got front left, front right. We also talked about um, far left, far right. Um, and we also talked about the rear. So everything that's from your shoulders forward if you were to take your, let me get my hands up here a little bit. So anything, if you take your, your fingers and point them forward, if your hands were out like this, okay, that's peripheral vision. Anything behind you has to be picked up with mirrors. So you're responsible for 180 degrees. The only thing that you've got to remember is that peripheral vision does two things. So write this down. Peripheral vision gives you the ability to see motion. It gives you the ability to see color. It does not give you detail. Think about that. You cannot read a sign, but you can tell it's a sign. You can see it's a white sign. You can see that it's a yellow sign, but you've got to see the symbol. You've got to see the wording. That's why when you're driving, and right now I'm going to look at the camera like I'm driving, that's why I'm going to have to look to the left, look to the right to pick up the detail. But the peripheral vision is what's going to give me you know, an idea that there's something over there that's really important. Um, there are four other aspects of vision that I'm going to go over real quickly. Uh, most of this is common sense stuff, but let's just talk about uh, color vision. I have a son-in-law that is colorblind. And a lot of times when I have a person that's colorblind in class, the question comes up, how do they know when the traffic light is red or if it's green? Okay, think about it. If you know where the light is placed, if you know the sequence of your lights, okay, then you basically know what light is on. You can just tell by how bright the light is. 
And what is the most important light to know? Its location. It is red. That is why it's on the top. Then followed by yellow in the middle and green at the bottom. So even if your vision is a little foggy, you should be able to tell by the intensity of the light coming on what the traffic light is. Uh, also, and we're going to talk more about lights in, a, in another section coming up at the last part of today's class. Um, but you should know your turn signals, hazard lights, backup lights, brake lights, where they're located and what they're color. But we're going to uh, go over that in a, a little bit further. Uh, the next thing I want you to write down is night vision. Remember the state does want you to continue to uh, drive at night. Uh, I would recommend doing more than what the, the 10 hours the state recommends prior to going for your uh, license test because driving at night is by far the hardest type of driving to do is because you really can't see that well. Uh, your ability to see in low variable light conditions will change with age. Uh, usually as you get older, uh, you're not going to like driving at night as much. Maybe your parents have already complained about picking you up at practice late at night. Uh, maybe you've heard your grandparents make comments about they don't like to come to visit if they have to leave the house late at night. Uh, it's because they can't see, and if you can't see, you can't make reliable uh, judgments and decisions when it comes to driving. Uh, other concerns are headlights. I mean, how many people are bothered by that new halogen headlight, that bluish tint that just kind of pierces the night, and it just puts, you, you know, the whole, everything that you see in front of you, it's just kind of out of focus. You just really can't see the road that, that well. That is a problem. Be careful driving around in a car with dark windshields. Um, poorly aimed headlights will not allow you to see the road as far as you can see. Now, low beams basically shine for around 100, 150 feet and around 300, 350 feet for high beams. Now, I want you to write this down. Do not use your high beams on roads where there are street lights. You should have enough light to guide you to where you're driving towards. Because if you're driving in downtown Durham, Dover, and you're, you're going to constantly have to go back and forth with dimming your lights. Much better to have your low beam on okay, when there are street lights around. But on a rural road, a back road, put on the high beams, but also be familiar with how to turn the high beam off on the directional lever in the driver's ed vehicle. And I'm sure that it's probably the same in your car. Although some of the older cars used to have a button on the on the floorboard that you used to dim your headlights just with your left foot rather than using your hand. Um, glare vision, write this down. Uh, this is why the first uh, week of class I mentioned about making sure that you have a pair of sunglasses with you when you drive. Um, if you're in the driver's ed vehicle you know that I carry an extra pair so I will freely give you that extra pair to use but once you're done with driver's ed and you're on your own, uh, you better have something with you because you don't want to be driving with one hand blocking the sun. Sun visor is good. It does help. Um, but for the most part, glasses are the way to go. That's the best. Okay, let's talk about uh, communication. So this is going to be where we talk a little bit about uh, giving and receiving information. You got to remember that when you're driving, you're not only giving information to other drivers, you're receiving information from other drivers and pedestrians and bicyclists and skateboarders, anything that's using the road with, with you. And one of the breakdowns for most students, once they really learn how to control a car, we talked about the three most important parts or the th only three things you can do a car is braking, steering, and accelerating. So once you get comfortable with that, the next step is to make better judgments. And you've got to learn communication will help you uh, drive better because people will know what you're doing and you'll be able to see what other people are doing and make better decisions. So let's kind of go down. I want you to write down a few things. Is A lot of people say, why do I really have to use my signal? I know what I'm doing. I don't care what other people think that I'm doing. Okay, you've got to be courteous. You've got to be cooperative. Uh, we all have to share the road. So give information, and hopefully people will use theirs, and you're going to receive the right information. The other thing I want you to write down is make sure that you give enough time. Um, what is usually recommended is probably four to five seconds before you're going to make a turn. 
um, in the old manual, and I don't think it's in your new new manual. I've got it right here. Uh, also, remember to read, uh, I believe, Part 5, Basic Driving, in the new manual. Uh, go through that, because uh, we're going to be talking about stopping and speed um, in the next session that I put here on YouTube. So go through that, too, with your reading that you're doing for your workout sheets that I'm giving you. Um, most people get nervous when they don't know what to do. I mean, that's natural. Is that pedestrian going to cross? Is the light going to change? Picking up and understanding communication that other people are giving you will make you less stressed. It will lessen the anxiety when you're driving. So look down the road, and we're going to have this in another class. Uh, you should be looking at least 20 to 30 seconds down the roadway. So make sure you write this down. I'm going to be giving this in a, it could be even in the next PowerPoint that we're going to go over today. Uh, 20 to 30 seconds, you should be looking down the road. And then you're going to hopefully pick up things that you think are going to be changing or, or moving in front of you. Untimely or non-communications. Uh, most people, once they get their license and they've been driving for a while, very competitive. So a lot of times it's just about getting up and getting that parking spot. They're not thinking about, i got to use my signal uh, to let people know I'm going in. You're just racing into that parking spot. That's really not the way that you want to drive. Uh, most people, when they see that you have your directional on, will give you a parking space. They go, oh, he wants that spot on the left, wants the spot on the right. Okay, okay, you can take it. You're closer to it. You've been waiting. Um, but sometimes people are going to, you know, race right in front of you if you don't have your signal on. So decrease the amount of time one needs to see and understand action. Um, that's not what you want. Uh, you want more time, not less time requires reaction rather than response. I mean, think about it. Would you like, response means that you have time and you're doing it correctly. A reaction could be uh, something that happens so quickly there's no thought process into what you're doing. You just see some movement, so you're moving too. Uh, like with a pedestrian, have you ever gone to a door when someone's coming towards you and you both are kind of going back and forth? Um, that's a reaction rather than probably a response. The other thing that down here at the bottom is that it uh, increased the risk to yourself and others. Not, not good. You, you really don't want that to happen. Okay, ways to communicate. So I do want you to write this down and uh, I'm gonna move my picture way over to the side right here so you can see everything. Okay, so let's write this down. Ways to communicate. First, Headlights, especially at night, okay? You've got to have your headlights on. We're going to learn about what time do we put our headlights on. It's a half hour after sunset to a half hour before sunrise. Um, but you want, did it just go? Yeah, how'd that happen? Let me go back. I don't know why that just changed on me, but it did. Okay, we talked about using your turn signals. Five seconds before you want to make your turn. Okay, hint, hint. Write this down for midterm. Okay, brake lights. Apply early and uh, know the speed of the person in front of you and behind you. Okay, your braking is predicated on understanding how fast the person in front of you is braking. And I want you to write this down, okay? When you use your brake pedal, your brake lights come on in the back. They tell people that you're braking, but it doesn't let them know how hard you're braking. Okay, write that down. My brake lights come on. It doesn't tell people how hard I'm braking. That's why people wait to brake. They go, oh, brake lights, I've got plenty of time. You're misjudging how hard they're hitting their brakes. They're slowing down a lot faster than you're slowing down. So brake early. Know the speed in front of you. Now, when I say behind you, Remember, if you're reacting quickly to a car that's braking in front of you and you're a late breaker and you've got a and the car is pitching to the forward part of your car, you're pitching forward, the car behind you is gonna have to hit their brakes even harder than you're hitting yours, or else you're gonna be rear-ended, especially if you're being tailgated. So make sure you brake early at the right amount of, of, of brake pressure for a smooth 
brake. And remember, always stopping back so you can see the tires of the car in front of you. Uh, reverse lights, and I asked this question uh, last week in class. It's amazing how many of you did not know this. I think it was almost the entire class. Okay, what color are your headlights? Remember, they're clear or white. You're going to have the same thing in the back of your vehicle. So write that down. Your backup lights, reverse lights, are white. They're not as bright as your headlights because you're not driving that fast in reverse. But it does illuminate what is happening behind you. So, as we said last week in class, why is this important? Because it warns people that you're going backwards. So when you're in an angle parking spot downtown, especially downtown Durham, you're gonna you're not gonna see the driver at first. You're gonna see their lights. You're gonna see the backup lights first. So be looking left and right when you're going through a downtown area uh, where you can't see the driver. Now let's talk about the horn, and we mentioned this when we did uh, vehicle equipment. Most people don't use the horn when they're supposed to. So make sure you write down to be seen. Now when you use the horn, what you're trying to accomplish is for the person to go to their brake pedal and to turn their head. That's what you're trying to accomplish. Do not use your horn as a sign of disgust or, or anger. Okay, We do not want road rage, and we're going to have a, a lesson on that. Uh, how to not get into the mode of of tearing people apart with road rage and how to, to handle it. Uh, hand signals you do need to know. Um, this is when you're going to have signals, directionals that aren't working any longer. Or if you've got a, uh, a truck or a van or something and people can't see the, the directional lights behind you, so your hand's being stuck out the window, they're going to be able to see um, better than your directionals. So you got to use hand signals and know that. The last two are probably one of the two most important uh, is lane position. So we talked about going left of center or right of center uh, for indicating which way you're going. So make sure in your notes you're going left of center for a left turn, right of center for a right hand turn. And also the slower you go into a turn people are going to know exactly what you're doing. But if you're not really slowing down that much, even though you've changed your position, there could be some miscommunication, there could be a misread of what you're actually doing. So make sure um, that you do that. Um, well, I don't know why that one just went out on me. Come back. How come that went out? There we go. Let me get right to the very end here. Oh, I went too far. All right, here we go. Here's the last one I want you to write down for this. I don't know where I went, but at least you've got this. Let's see. Okay, write down common errors. Forgetting. I can't say how many of you I've taken out to do parking with. They're going to score you when you go for your driving test, whether you use your signal when you park. Okay, make it a habit. Every time you drive with your parents, signal going in, signal going out. Same thing with your backup lights. It tells people you're backing up and that you're going to the right and to the left. Um, too late. You want to give people more time to know what you're doing, so put it on those five seconds. Uh, the other thing about turn signals that is sometimes handy, so I want you to write this down, is 100 feet before a turn is probably right around four or five seconds. So what does 100 feet look like? 100 feet on the road is pretty close to two telephone poles from where you're going to be making your turn. So look where your turn is, find a telephone pole, come back about a telephone pole, put your directional on there. What does it look like on a highway? On a highway, you're supposed to put your directional on about 500 feet before you make a turn. So that would probably be one of your last signs before your exit. So if you write that down, that will help you uh, when you're out there on the road. Um, that takes us right 
to the end of this PowerPoint. So we're one down. We're going to try to go uh, for um, about another half hour or so, and then I'm going to tell you what uh, your homework is. So let me uh, get out of this and get a new one in here. Oh, let me get out of. I knew there were going to be glitches like this today. Uh, I apologize. Let's see if I pull this in. Okay, that's what I want. Okay. So let's talk about turning and signaling. We've kind of already hit up on that um, already. Uh, here's a video. Um, if I can get this into the screen. This is the corner of Firestone and Bandera. This furniture store here and you can see that hole there it's the shape of a chp cruiser because during that pursuit that's what we saw that cruiser okay, this went was right through it we have earlier tape of that this is the pursuit that started at 4 45 this morning here you go we're going to slow it down for you that white sedan there making the quick turn there onto bandera and the chp cruiser right into that building good news is is, this, is the officer was not injured at least not injured seriously this officer probably never heard the end of it um Driving into a building is not is something that you never never get over. Um, I don't know why this is still on. If I can get back to the computer screen, there we go. So I'm sure that he's going to be ribbed for the rest of his career about oh you're the police officer that drove into the building. But let's talk about why that actually happened. Well, it could be the brakes went out. I mean, very well could be. But the reason why I showed you that is that. Speed is the biggest enemy of turns. So write that down in your notes. Okay. If you want to make good turns, there is a certain speed with the position of your vehicle coming into the turn to be smooth and timely and to make a decent turn. And we're going to have this on a, on a slide coming up in a, in a moment. But the slower, write down in your notes, the slower you go into the turn, the smoother it will be. I'd much rather see you make a turn a little bit too slow than a little bit too fast. Because too fast, like we saw in the video, it's gonna, you're going to crash into the things. You're going to cross over the center line, maybe um, hit other people. So, so through the use of good uh, vision and judgment and knowing speed, you're going to make sound decisions and make good turns. And I already showed you that, so I'm going to get out of that. All right, so let's write down a few things. We already had this today. Decide well ahead of the spot where you're going to turn. Uh, in your notes, you should have written down 20, 30 seconds. And we already talked about move to the proper position for the turn. And we were already turned, or no one we putting our turn signals on, 100 feet in town and 500 on, on the open road. Um, here we go. Now I'm back. Okay. So here's the speed uh, recommendation. Let's see if I can just go up here just a little bit. Okay. First thing I want you to write down. Check your mirror for traffic behind you. So just as you're putting your turn signal on, you're checking what's behind you. How close is that person really behind me? You want to give them enough time to deal with your turn. Second thing, check your blind spot in the direction that you want to turn. More so in town because bicyclists, rollerbladers, even if you're going really slow, sometimes even people that are running could be coming up on the side of your vehicle. You never want to kind of, you know, turn in, in front of Oh, I don't think that, boy, that's quite a picture. My camera went off. Okay, I'm going to just take a, a moment here just to change batteries, and then we'll get right at it. So we're going to stop right here for a second. Um, it's 4.54, so let's take five minutes, and I'm going to switch batteries and come right back, and we're going to finish up with uh, the remainder of today's class.
looks like I still got 14 people. This is really good. For those that haven't um, tuned in, okay, this is still part of your break. You may get up and be stretching or getting a bite to eat or whatever, but um, I'm going to see who's been watching and who's been leaving comments because this is uh, going to be um, the chance for you to finish up driver's ed while you're uh, home. Um, and those that aren't online doing this when they're supposed to with me, uh, we'll be rejoining another class whenever school opens up. And that could be a long time. That could actually be like this summer. But we'll see what happens. So I'm hoping people take advantage of this. Um, I'm hoping to work out the kinks after today's video and uh, see what's going on. But I really appreciate you guys hanging in there with me and doing this. I can't imagine. I know that most of you wanted your license for uh, April vacation and you know, even some of you for the summer. And This is just pushing it back, but this is what we can do. All right, I think I'm back, and it's let's just kind of wrap things up real quick here. I won't, shouldn't say real quick because i got to take a look and see what we got left. Let's turn the camera here a little bit. Move it back a little bit. All right, so I believe that we were right here on the third bullet point is uh, right in your notes, right-hand turns are always going to be slower than left-hand turns. So you're looking at 5 to 10 miles per hour. So that's pretty slow, and it's pretty tight. Left-hand turns can uh, be made at a little bit of a faster speed than a right-hand turn uh, because it's a little bit wider. Uh, so it allows for a little bit of a faster speed. But remember, you are stopping on a left-hand turn with oncoming cars. You can't just blindly cut people off. Okay, Even though you've got your signal on, you're communicating, you're making a left-hand turn. Do not cut in front of people. And remember, if the person has to use their brakes to allow you to make a left-hand turn, you do not yield right away. You cut them off. You could be given a ticket. Uh, two definitions that I want you to write down. The first definition is a gap. A gap is a space between vehicles. A hole is a space between a cluster of cars. So a hole is actually larger than a gap. And you've heard me say this in class. You've heard me say this um, in the car. It is better to wait to pull out into traffic. Don't take your first opening, take your best opening. That is your goal. Let's move this up just a, just a tad. Okay, vision checks. Um, always scanning. Whenever you see an intersection, and especially since you're in Durham or Madbury and Lee, uh, where you're from, but you do most of your driving with me in Durham and Dover. Um, you know the biggest problem that we have is picking up pedestrians. So the more that you scan and the more you use your peripheral vision, the better off you're going to be. So look all the way to the right, look all the way to the left, just not what's in front of you. Okay, you've got to look all the way around. Uh, need to write this down for the midterm. Hint, hint, hint. Here we go. When turning out in front of another vehicle, you must do three things. We know the first one is the obvious one. You need to use your turn signal. That's indicating which way you're going. We're also going to see a change of your speed. And lastly, a change of your position. So you're going left of center for a left-hand turn. You're going right of center for a right-hand turn. Uh, don't have to write this down, but we have found through many studies what are some common problems for turning. Uh, people go way too fast, and if you're not staying in your lane, you're not holding that center position, you're going too far left, too far right, it's going to be evident by going over the lines. Late directional, oversteering, understeering. Okay, Remember, there is a mark-off. I've got it right here. Let me show you. Okay, Got it upside down. Okay. Remember the score sheet that I showed you that they will actually have on a clipboard when they take you out for your license test? There is a place for them to mark off how smoothly you make your turn. Just because you didn't hit anybody doesn't mean that you're going to pass your test. They're looking at your speed and your position as you're going in and out of your turn. So remember again, the slower you go, the better off your turn is going to be. 
um, communicate the wrong intention. Some of you still are having a problem with lefts and rights. Now, I don't have a real problem if you put your left signal on, if I said take a right, but you put your left on and you go left, because you're actually going the way you indicated. I have a problem if I say make a right-hand turn, and you put your left directional on, and then you turn right. Because the minute your left directional goes on, there's a good chance the person behind you sees that. They go, oh, they're, they're turning left. Well, then they're going to start going off to the right of you, okay, to pass you on the right. That's when you're going to drive a car off the side of the road. And that is your problem because you indicated the wrong thing. Um, can't find a turning area. Uh, uh, if we were in class and I had everybody here, and I know you've been uh, following along on, on YouTube here, but think of different ways that you could find a road. The most obvious, of course, is the gap or the break in the yellow line for a left-hand turn, the break in the white line for a right-hand turn, and, of course, our street sign. But I want you to think out of the box. Think about there are no lines or you've got snow on the ground. How are you going to find the break? Um, how are you going to find the street sign if it's covered with wet snow? So start thinking about a wide area um, of pavement. Because driveways aren't as big as roadways, usually. Um, you could have mailboxes, like the federal government mailbox at the end of an intersection. You could have a street light that's going to actually tell you where there's an intersection. Uh, even the telephone wires will cross over on the opposite side to where there's an intersection. Um, in the wintertime, a snow bank, okay? Higher banked snow is an indicator you're coming up to a roadway and, and not usually a driveway. Um, a gap between houses, uh, a sidewalk when there's a gap. So there's, there's different ways that you're going to be finding um, these turning areas. Uh, please don't use your, uh, keep your directional on. After you've made your turn, turn them off. You, you, you don't want to keep it on for too, for too long. Okay, signaling. When and This used to be a question. I had, haven't changed this. I forgot to change it this morning when I uh, put, this, put this on. Uh, I do want you to write all these down. Okay, these are, are all situations you're going to be using your turn signal. Changing lanes, turning at an intersection, enter or leave an expressway, pull away from the curb, pull over to the side of the road, like an emergency vehicle is coming up behind you. Legally, you're supposed to pull over and stop for that emergency vehicle. You've got to use your directional. That's indicating to the police officer you see him coming up from behind and that you're moving over and you are stopping. And then the two... At the bottom here are what most people don't write down. So I want you to make sure you use your directional for parking. And let's see who's going to be the first to answer. Um, when you're parking, what type of parking does not require a directional when you're backing out? Let's see who writes this down first. So what type of parking doesn't require directional when backing out? I see you guys are having your own conversation about rats. It's interesting. So who's going to come up? Who's going to come up with the type of parking that you don't have to use your directional? I'm still waiting for an answer here. I'm looking down at my phone. There may be a little bit of a delay. Maybe that's what it is. No one's going to help me out. Let's see who's still on here. we got 11 people still on. Okay, angle parking. I'll give it to you. Angle parking does not require. Uh, there we go. Jack got it. Jack. Julia would be proud of you, even though I didn't have you in driver's ed. Angle parking. Someone that I don't have in my current class. Way to go, Jack. Way to score. Um, yeah, angle parking does not require um, directional. So good. And then uh, backing. Uh, and it, my, my philosophy is better to have your directional on not needed than to need and not have it on. Other situations where uh, turn signals, we talked about, whoa, why did that? Oh, there, it's just my, my mouse. Um, hand signals, remember, right-hand turn, okay? Left-hand turn, get my hand, stop, slow down. So make sure you know your hand signals. 
when would tapping your brakes be advised? Okay, turning off the highway when there is no deceleration lane. Okay, so you may want to add that into your notes. Uh, we're really talking about probably coming underneath a, pat, uh, a bridge uh, and you only have maybe like 80, 90 feet to slow down. Tap your brakes a couple times before you go off on the edge. Um, parking, and that would be parallel parking, which is where you're tapping your brakes before you get to your parallel parking spot. Then you're moving up in front of your parking spot and then you're backing in. And then when there's something um, in the road that you're trying to miss, like a box or a pothole. It's important to tap your brakes. Okay, this is something I need you to know for the midterm. The law states that drivers must not follow another vehicle more closely than is reasonable. The question here is who judges reasonable? It's the police. So if they think that you're tailgating, there is a, a, a ticket that they can give you that you're following too closely. It's not reasonable to be closer than four seconds. So use that four second rule. A little bit more space, five or six in bad weather. So what you're doing is you're picking an object on the side of the road. You go past that object, you basically start counting. So the car go, goes by it, you start going in your head one, two, three, four seconds. That's what you need. Used to be three. They bumped it up in the new manual. So just make sure that you've got that in your notes. Um, when stopped on a hill, especially if a car in front of you is a manual, and it's very hard for you to even know that if, unless you saw them stop beforehand, there could be some type of a roll. So when stopped on a hill, stay back about one car length. And when you're behind traffic on level ground, stay back so you can see their tires touching the pavement. I'm going to move this over. Uh, there's really no place to put it. Let's see if I can make it a little bit smaller. Nope. All right. Crosswalk, stay back about 10 or 15 feet while someone is crossing and never stop on a crosswalk in heavy traffic. I've had a few of you in downtown Dover when we've been driving lately that you stopped on um, a crosswalk inadvertently. Okay, We've had a couple people have to go off the crosswalk to go in front of us to get all the way across. I'll see if I can find the video, but I've seen a video where someone has actually crossed over the top of a vehicle. To prove a point, you should not stop on a crosswalk. Since you did, I'm going to walk over the top of your vehicle. I believe it was the hood. I'll see if I can find it and put it into the next um, into the next session that we have. Uh, stay back 500 feet from a fire truck. This is what I want you to write down in your notes so you remember this. Anything in the state dealing with footage with fire apparatus, anything dealing with fire, there's going to be a five in the number. One of the hardest things on any driving test is to remember numbers. Okay, you just got to flat out remember it. So 500 feet, if a fire truck is just responding to a fire alarm, you've got to stay back about, about 500 feet. Uh, tailgaters, there are three ways that you can uh, handle a tailgater. One, um, flash your brakes. Two, reduce your speed in an area where they can pass. So move over to the right. But remember, you're slowing down reducing your speed in an area that they safely and legally can do it. And then the last one would be to pull over and let them pass. Okay. I don't know many people that I've had for drivers that I've had them pull over. We've gone slow and we let people go around us, but we normally don't stop because I usually don't put you in situations unless I know that you can handle that speed. But let's go back to number one first here. Uh, flashing your brake lights. And I put here in the notes, and you may want to write this down, that when you do tap your brakes, you are indicating to the person behind you that you know that they're tailgating and that you're not really happy with it. Well, they may not be happy with the speed that you're going. So you're going to get two outcomes. One is positive where they go, oh, man, I wasn't paying attention. I'm sorry. And you'll see them back off and you've accomplished what you want. And that's what we really hope will happen. But it doesn't always. The negative is they'll get closer. They go, oh, you think I'm close now? Watch this and they actually will get closer to your vehicle. Now, I know it's going to be tempting to brake check, to, to make them slam on their brakes, and then a lot of people have told me, well, if they hit us, it's their fault, and you know we'll just collect from the insurance company. Well, let me tell you, dealing with an insurance company is a pain, and you're going to have to lose your car for a little bit while they fix it. You don't want to be involved in a crash. Don't brake check people. I'll tell you one funny story before we move to the next slide. I was reading in the paper of an older gentleman in Texas in a pickup truck that was 
being followed too closely and uh, was a young person that was following him too close. Uh, it was a rural part of Texas and when they got up to the next intersection, wasn't really much of anything around, but the pickup truck stopped, the car behind stopped, and the old man got out of his pickup truck and he grabbed one of his rifles from his, from his gun rack. And he proceeded to shoot all four tires of that young person's car. No kidding. He said, he didn't say a word to the, to the young person. He just basically paid, you know, made him pay the price of tailgating. And he shot all four tires. Now, of course, that made national news, and that's how I heard about it. And, of course, the guy that shot off the tires, that's not the type of behavior that you want. But uh, you always hear some strange stories when it comes comes to driving. Uh, this I do want you to write down and see if I can move this over. There we go. All right, we've already talked about 20, 30 seconds looking ahead. The next time frame that I want you to write down is 15 seconds, and let's talk about that. The visual scanning uh, area uh, is basically picking up three to four uh, possible problems. Let's make believe that we're driving. You're looking down the road, you see a traffic light, you see a pothole, and you see a dog that's loose. Okay, you've got three things that you think you're going to have to deal with. Then you're putting them in order of when they're coming. Pothole is first. So what do you do? Could straddle it, move to the right, move to the left, depends what you have for traffic. Then you've got the dog, which is probably the worst thing to encounter, especially when that's not on a leash. Okay, what are you going to do? You better slow down. You better try not to hit it. Then lastly is the traffic light. But you're putting things in order and you're giving yourself an idea of how you're going to handle each problem. So this third point here is within 5 or 15 seconds, you're putting them in order in what you're going to do. Uh, shouldn't be three seconds following distance. It should be four. And less than three seconds is a crash zone. And basically, if I have to use my instructor brake, we are in a crash zone. I cannot speak out what I want you to do, so I have to step in. And as I told you in class, just because I use the brake doesn't mean that you're going to fail driver's ed, that I think that you're a bad driver. It's just that I cannot speak out what I want you to do. All right? So if it's in that area and I'm using the brake, something you didn't handle and I had to handle for you. So hopefully we're not going to encounter many of those. Uh, passing, this is something that we're not going to uh, do in driver's end unless it comes up. Uh, why is that still going forward when I'm not hitting it? i got to go back. All right. Driving at night is even more difficult for uh, learning how to pass. And at 55 miles per hour, you'll need at least 10 to 20 seconds to complete a pass. I want you to write that down. 10 to 20 seconds is usually a normal time frame. Um, for passing. Uh, of course, the faster your car, and the faster you make your car go, you're going to need less time. And if your car doesn't move very fast, then of course it's going to take a little bit longer. But this is just a general uh, time frame of when it's going to take you. So let's just talk about if passing does come up when we're driving, okay? The first thing I want you to write down is that if you have any fear of doing it, you shouldn't do it. So if there's any doubt at all, don't pass especially if it's oncoming cars. Now, if you're passing on a multi-lane highway, it's more of a lane change than it is passing, if that makes any sense. And you know that I always take you downtown Durham to work on lane changes because I will not take you on a highway to do a lane change if we don't do them well at 25 miles per hour. Why would I make you go up onto a highway at 55 and make a lane change? Because then all your, your problems are going to be magnified, and we don't want that to happen. So check the passing lane. So that means looking at your rearview mirror, uh, looking in your left side mirror, or if you're passing someone on the right, it would be your right side mirror. Uh, check your blind spot, signal, and then move over. Uh, the other problem that a lot of people have, especially new drivers, is they don't keep up their speed. They go out to pass somebody, and then they drop their speed right down. Uh, this is important for the midterm. Write down that when you see their headlights, the whole grill of their vehicle, then basically it's time for you to move back over to your lane. So you see both headlights, don't even look over your shoulder. They're behind you. They're not beside you any longer. You can move over. Signal, 
before moving back and you have to get back with oncoming cars. So we're talking about a rural road now where there's passing allowed. You've got to get back within uh, 200 feet of any oncoming vehicle that's coming towards you. So you're looking at about the distance between three telephone poles. And that's not a whole lot, uh, especially if you're going around 35, 40 miles per hour. Uh, passing on the right is allowed, of course, downtown Durham, where it's a one-way street, two lanes going the same direction, and on a highway. But a lot of people don't realize that if a car is turning left and they've got a good position left of center and there's enough pavement to the right of you, you can pass on the right. But do it early, do it slowly, and always check your mirror before you move over. So you want to move over early, bring down your speed while you're checking your mirror to see what cars behind you are doing. If a car is turning left and you come right up behind him and you don't have your turn signal on, you're just waiting for him to move, do not be surprised if people start passing you on the right because they think that you're turning left. So pay attention to your rear view mirror, side view mirror, if you choose to wait behind. And you are going to choose to wait if, if there's not enough pavement because you never want the right side of your vehicle going onto the soft shoulder. Because when your tire comes back on it, it could tear. Um, passing is not allowed unless the left lane of the road is clear, crest of a hill, curve. 100 feet of a viaduct bridge or tunnel, a viaduct is an area on a highway that comes down into a V. If you're in the city, it's usually concrete. If you ever saw the movie uh, Grease and when they were having those races um, in the movie, they were in this huge viaduct in Los Angeles where they were passing and going up on this banked area. That's a viaduct. 100 feet of an intersection railroad crossing and, of course, no passing zones marked by signs. So let's see. Who can answer in um, their in uh, YouTube here? What is the shape of a no passing zone sign? Let's see who can come up with that. Let's see if anybody's still here. We got got eleven. We got a few people. Got to stay in for the long haul to get credit here, because we're almost done. We're gonna go uh, right to uh, five thirty, and then we're done. Because we have, we're making up for some lost time here. Okay, the shape. Since no one's writing it down, it is a pennant-shaped sign. Okay, it is one of the few signs that you will find on the left side of the road. Most of your signs, like 98, 97 percent of the signs, are always off to the right. But a no pennant-shaped sign is going to be over on the left side. Uh, it also marks the beginning of where you get your solid yellow line. Uh, lane usage, um, right lane, if there's two lanes, is for slow or moving. Left is for passing. Multi-lane highways, right is for slow. Middle is for smooth. And left is for high speed. Um, we will get a lesson on the highway at some point when we uh, get back to driving because right now I think we're going to, um, you know, suspend driving for the for the time being. I, I didn't get that many people um, telling me that they were wanted to do it so lane changes uh, need to know this for the uh, midterm so write this down first thing is directional to indicate you're making a lane change second thing is you're checking your rear view mirror first and then your side view mirror now if your car is equipped with um, uh, blind spot monitors you can use that but remember the light is usually indicating there's someone in that but you better still know where they are and what speed they're traveling through that area so it's good to know that they're there, but you still got to know how to deal with it. So directional, rear view mirror, side view mirror, and then shoulder check where your chin is going to your shoulder. No further, don't look out the back of the car. Okay, And then the last thing is move over to the lane uh, with either increasing, maintaining, or slowing down depending on what you have for traffic that's coming up behind you. And that is our last slide. So let me just kind of wrap up a few things here before we go. Um, so in review, okay, got to use your eyes better. Um, make sure that uh, you're not bothered by glare. Uh, understand how important it is to pick up everything while you're driving. Inattention blindness and change blindness is real and it will happen to you at some point when you drive. Um, 
So what I'd like you to do is to finish reading uh, chapter 7 in the textbook, and I text out or sent out um, review questions of what we've covered and what the chapter has. So do those. Send it back to me on your phone. Read part 5. Read part 5 here. Okay, in the state manual. Okay, and that's basically what we've covered to a certain extent, although they do cover a little bit more. Um, and if you want to get ahead of the curve, um, Chapter 3, which is Sign Signals and Payment Markings, um, we'll probably have that will be our third session. The next session that we do um, is going to be on braking, uh, stopping, and speed. And it probably won't be quite as long as this section, but you'll have uh, some things to do um, at home and a little bit more work to do with that. Uh, I'd like to say thank you for tuning in and uh, taking the time to get this information because I think it will be useful. I hope this will be saved to YouTube. So if you want to go back and review it, you can take a look at it. Um, I think the information that you're going to get with the reading and what uh, I gave you today uh, will help you for the midterm and to make you a better, a safer driver. And that's what I want to do in lieu of not having you in class. And since we're going to probably suspend driving for the next two weeks, uh, it's going to be a while See, I see you guys again. But at least I want to be able to give those that are putting in the time and the effort a chance to check off that they've done the classroom. So kudos to you to, that hung in um, and provided comments. And I still find it strange that someone that uh, – already has a license, uh, jumped in and joined in with the uh, comments. But that's cool, too. That's what it's all about, is to have some fun. And that's what I want to do. And I hope you got something out of this. And um, I'll see you at the next session. I will text you. There is going to be a set time that we have, because I don't know when I'm going to get the next one up and loaded. And like I said, I've got some glitches that I'm working on right now. And I hope to have that out. But please provide me with some comments of what you thought. You know, is it beneficial? Is this something that you want to continue on? Or do you want to join a, a later class, say, in, in May or something? Or, or even June or July. Hopefully I'll be teaching that. Um, so have a good night. Stay safe and don't go, go stir crazy. Stir crazy. See you later. Bye.